The next speaker is Anuru Sheila Virasamy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have been told many times in my life, more than I can remember, that I think too much and I feel too much. Ever since November 28th, after listening to the Honorable Minister presenting the 2017 budget, a feeling of helplessness gripped me, a feeling of disappointment. <laughs> Sir, I cannot believe that I could have actually witnessed such heartlessness expressed through measures that increased hardship on our people. Since May 2015, to impose 130 tax measures is not a trivial matter. Sir, the day I was sworn in as a member of this parliament, I felt a great sense of pride. But that was soon eclipsed. Because on that very day, 11 taxes were imposed on this nation. 11 of 130 taxes which has nothing to do with what is being unfolded in front of us. Mr. Speaker, a government that promised a good life for all in the 2015 elections campaign reduced corporate tax from 30% to 28.5% in 2016 to stimulate economic growth. And sir, I'm all for that. I am all for a good life for the people of my country. This is a good measure, but this same government found it palatable to unleash tax burdens on low-income earners, single parents, the vulnerable, and the pensioners, driving them deeper into the abyss of poverty. Sir, I am not an economist, but I'm not ignorant of the frivolous and insincere statements made in this August House that are reeked with rhetoric. Sir, after presenting its third budget, I would assume that the saying, you were there for 23 years, why didn't you do it? Well, this would become, this should have become an old scratch record. No, no, sir. I'm not one of those persons who cannot take criticisms. On the contrary, sir, the late great Dr. Chedi Jagan, former president of Guyana Thought, being one of his students, how to stand tall while criticisms flow towards me. For constructive criticism, sir, make me develop and grow. It made me into the person I am today. But certainly not criticisms that are filled with ambiguities, misinformation, and lies. I've been asked in this house by many of my colleagues, how do you like it here? And I said, I hate the lies. I hate the innuendos. And I hate the fabrications. Sir, that statement reminds me of a marriage that gone bad, where one of the spouse continues to play the victim to generate sympathy. I must say, sir, people get tired of whining and griping because they are not stupid. And we must not hold this nation as a stupid people. I have walked the Caribbean, I've walked many countries in the world, and I have found particularly so, Guyanese are the most politically educated people in the entire Caribbean, and I can vote for that any time. People watch, they observe, they listen. Through these mediums, they formulate opinions. Mr. Speaker, the PPP civic government of 23 years did it. It inherited a broken economy, a malnourished people, a citizenry that, whose life expectancy was in the 50s, a medical system that killed people rather than saved them, dilapidated infrastructures and worse than all of the above, a wage freeze. My God, I don't want to remember the foreign debt that took away almost 94 cents of every dollar and left every very little to buy food for our people. In the face of all this, Mr. Speaker, a sound macroeconomic framework with prudent fiscal and monetary policies 
resulted in better wages, stable exchange rates, reduced inflation, and continuous economic growth for 23 years. Poverty, Mr. Speaker, I lived it. I lived in the first 28 years of my life under the PNC government. And my dear Mr. Speaker, we are not going to hide the PNC in the Aknu coalition. I am not going to do that. All around, one could have seen disempowerment, depression due to high levels of unemployment and low income. Mr. Speaker, the Income and Expenditure Survey Living Standard Measurement Survey to determine poverty in 1992, assisted by UNDP and the World Bank, showed that the PPP civic government inherited a country that where, sorry, where almost 80% of our people lived in poverty, with 43% living below the poverty line, and 29% lived in extreme poverty. This was a survey that was done in 2000 that showed this reality in 1992. When our blue coalition inherited the economy from the PPP civic government in 2015, Guyana was earning a GDP of $6,895, almost three times larger than that of 1992. Mr. Speaker, allow me to address what the 14% VAT imposition on water and electricity and other items including food and other basic amenities will do to our people living in poverty, especially those living below the poverty line. Reducing VAT by 2% is one of APNU's campaign promise. But the way the Minister of Finance expects to recoup the 2% tax from the VAT is amazing, sir. This imposition of 14% VAT on electricity and water is not a tax measure to be taken lightly. This tax measure is draconian. It, it, it intends to suck the blood out of the poor people and it will only contribute to furthering their impoverishment. Mr. Speaker, this 14% is not only limited to water and electricity, but as the weeks progress in front of us, we will hear about all the food items that the PPP civic government put as zero rated. We will hear about them, that the same four people will have to pay that 14% part on. Mr. Speaker, the PRSP document of 2000 stated that approximately 50,000 families in Guyana are single parent families, most of whom were female single parent households. Most single parent women are, are unskilled low income earners who work as security guards domestics or street corner sellers, etc., to take care of their families. The Honorable Minister proudly claimed in his budget presentation that low-income workers' salary in the Guyana Public Service increased to 50000 in 2015 and 55000 in 2016 with a tax ceiling of $60,000. Yes, I do give him credit for that. I do. But how does he take this away back from the ordinary people. This is what is hurting the feelings. And if we are people with a heart, with a soul that actually feel for the people out there who we claim to represent in here, then we will surely understand what they are going through. Mr. Speaker, without that, without that, sir, people were complaining all the time about the high rates of electricity. They complained all the time. Mr. Speaker, what will become of the mother who has five children and sell at the street corner to make a living when she doesn't have an accounting book to declare her earnings? What will become of her if she has no money in the bank for the, govern, for the government through the GRA to siphon off? Is she going to go to jail? 
This budget did not tell the woman who is a single mother how to impoverish, how her impoverished state will improve. This budget didn't tell her how she will be able to feed her children. This budget didn't tell her how she will send her children to school, how she will pay her rent, but this budget told her that 14% VAT will be imposed on her utility bill and on the food she will have to buy to feed her children. Sir, she is already subsidizing GPL by buying candles and kerosene oil for her lamps because of the never-ending blackouts. She is already subsidizing the Guyana Water Incorporation by buying purified water for her family to drink. How is she going to survive this, sir? This is what I would like the Honorable Minister to explain to this nation. I have too much respect for women and for myself, sir, to ask the Honorable Minister what does he expect women to do to increase her income, to provide for her family and pay her bills. But I can ask him, sir, to find out from his executive why they increase the tax burden on poor people, I can implore him, sir, to appeal to the executive to revisit these measures that impose financial burdens on the poor and on the privileged and to revise these measures or remove them. Mr. Speaker, my life work in politics is dedicated to the struggle of women's empowerment and I am not one for rhetoric. I am speaking to the fact that women accounts for more than 50% of this population. Mr. Speaker, where poverty exists, women are always the poorest. That means, sir, that since poverty exists in Guyana, women and girls are the poorest. Women and girls are the most vulnerable. How come, sir, this budget makes me feel so disgusted? Where has the women's, woman's element gone from the budget, sir? The struggle for gender equality and gender equity has long been a difficult one. And the day it takes a top place in the national agenda, it will be a dream come true for me and all women's advocates, beginning with the late great Janet Jagan, the late president of Guyana, and the woman who introduced Guyanese women to politics. Sir, this budget is utopian. We are all aware that utopia is a dream that is not a reality. While we all want utopia, this budget lacks what it takes to fulfill people's dreams. I am working with Honorable Father Lawrence and I do respect what she aims to do for underprivileged people, troubled children, the elderly, especially women. But sir, this budget puts her in a predicament. How will she be able to empower women economically and bring them out of poverty? How this budget, how, when this budget is an econo economic disaster, I pray that God grant her a magic wand to appease the woes this budget has unleashed on our people. Where is the funding to increase knowledge and the skills of single parent women and vulnerable girls? Where is the funding to build the capacity of women and girls for political participation in governance? How does the minister intend to ensure that the leadership capacity is built so that they can influence decisions that affect their lives, so that they can change the power dynamics in their family, at their workplace, in the community, in their favor? I asked the minister of finance, how will he provide the answer to this? Sir, if this government really wants to provide a good life for all, why is it bent on pushing this grouping over the margin of society into deeper poverty? Why, sir, can this be explained? The people of Guyana are so scared, so insecure, and so frustrated. They feel the contraction of the economy. They feel the brunt of the economic depression this country is going through. They are living it, sir. They are not getting jobs. The construction industry has collapsed. Sugar workers are living under the daily threat that the sugar industry will be shut down and tens of thousands of them will be out of the jobs. The rice industry is struggling as it hasn't in over 20 years. A good life for whom, Mr. Speaker? A good life for whom? I personally want a good life. Since Monday 20th of November, this nation is gripped with fear. 
fear of economic doom, fear of going back to the 1980s. Well, Mr. Speaker, I lived the 1980s. I won't, I will not sit idly by and allow myself to go back there. Not at all, sir, not at all. I was there with my parents. This time I have children and I will never allow them to go where I was and where I have emerged from. I struggled for the restoration of democracy in 1992 so that our people wouldn't have to go through such hardships ever again. I sacrificed to ensure that the economic policies had a human face and people would be given the opportunity to improve their lives. If you mean that you really want a good life for all, Mr. Minister, then this budget has to include people in it. It must be.